Uh, let's start the seminar by Mustafa Amin. Oh, Mustafa Amin is visiting us from uh, Rice University. He agreed to give a seminar on dark matter with uh, a short introduction for, uh, for the students who are not experts on dark matter. But then later it will be uh, more specific on the a vector dark matter model that he's working on. Uh, thank you. Okay, so thanks, Mardad. It's been great. It's been great talking to uh, old friends as well as to the new students uh, that I've met. Um, so I changed my mind a little bit compared to what Mardad just described. So I will talk about. Uh, this new work on vector dark matter, but instead of giving you an introduction to dark, to dark matter generally all the way at the beginning, I'm going to intersperse it along the way, wherever the need arises, to give you more details. Okay, uh, okay so let me start uh, by saying that I'm going to talk about, most of the talk I'm going to be, talk, I'm going to be telling you something about uh, these three papers that are here. Um, and it's about, mostly about vector dark matter or just dark matter that is made up of particles of higher spin, okay? not just scalars, but vectors, perhaps even massive, uh, massive tensors. Uh, before I begin, the work is in collaboration with these people up here. Uh, on all three papers is Mudit Jain, who is a postdoc at Rice. Uh, Hongyi Zhang is on one of them. He's uh, a graduate student, and Rohit is a undergraduate, and Philip is a research scientist, uh, not at Rice. Okay. Uh, let me minimize this. Okay. Somebody asked me a question uh, about uh, what is this going on? It appears only there. Yeah. It's on, it's on my screen. Oh, that's yours. Are you sharing the entire screen? No. Mm, can you try? I've lost control. Oh, there, it's back. Okay. Let me... I think it's, it, it'll, it'll be okay, yeah. From you. This from you. Hide video panel, hide floating meeting controls. They need them to stop share and then share the whole screen. I think this should be fine now. Okay. Yeah? I tried to remove it, so. Okay. So, uh, somebody asked me, uh, when I said I was from Rice, I said where Rice is. I thought given that this is a cosmology school, I would give my cosmic address. And uh, appropriately, uh, so we are at the center of the universe, uh, at least SDSS <laughs> claims so. Uh, and uh, not quite at the center of the galaxy, but it's okay. For the whole universe, we are the center. It's, it's, it's okay. So we are in uh, Houston, Texas, uh, in the US. And if you want to know more about Rice, just uh, ask me afterwards. Okay, so before I get into the details of the talk, uh, especially, given that there is an audience on Zoom as well, and I know how tired I get on Zoom within the first five minutes. Uh, so I will give you the punchline first, and then start with the talk, because I'm sure half the people will not be listening uh, after the first five minutes. Okay, so the main motivation of this work for me, apart from the fact that it is a lot of fun, is I want to know whether we can tell something about the spin of dark matter from astrophysical observations. Okay. I hope that by the end of this talk, you will be able to tell that these two simulations that look rather similar okay, have differences between them, and you will be able to tell that one of them is a scalar dark matter simulation, and one of them is a vector dark matter simulation. And there will be a test in the end. So uh, 
So pay attention. Okay. Okay. In a little bit more detail, I'm going to tell you that if dark matter is made up of a light vector field, then it contains within it a class of solitons, localized over densities that are ground states of the system. This is not different from scalar dark matter. The interesting thing about these is that these solitons are polarized and have macroscopic amount of intrinsic spin angular momentum. And this is a new thing about these guys. I will also tell you that in these models of dark matter, there is a potentially observable signature in the form of interference patterns. This is wave-like dark matter, so there is observable signature in terms of that, which is different from the case when it is made up of scalar dark matter. Somewhat, a little bit more speculatively, even the shape of halos is slightly different. Okay. Finally, time permitting, I will also tell you a bit more about the formation mechanism of vector dark matter, as well as these objects. As Merdad mentioned, interspersed through this sort of research presentation, I will also give you some pedagogical introduction, short bits of it in terms of things about dark matter, things about differences between particle and wave-like dark matter, a little bit about solitons, uh, and a little bit about the power spectrum of density fluctuations as well. All of these things are required in my talk, so I'll just do a slightly longer introduction than normal for these concepts as I go along. With that, let me start the main part of the talk. And again, please feel free to interrupt me throughout. My plan is, uh, so Merdad told me the talk is about 10 hours, so I'll take a break at five uh, in the middle. Uh, maybe for five minutes, because uh, I'll need to go to use the restroom. But otherwise, you know, I'm sure you will all be here. OK. Well, given the fantastic work that the, your lecturers have done for me, my life is a lot easier. Okay. Um, Asim, as well as Marco, have done a fantastic job of introducing density fluctuations and also a bit about dark matter along the way. So I'll just start by saying, well, I think we all mostly agree that dark matter exists, and we know it exists because of its gravitational interactions. Okay. What we don't know is what are the properties of dark matter? What is its charge? What is its spin? What is its mass? What are its interactions within itself and with the stuff that you and I are made up of? Is it an elementary particle, or is it some composite thing made up of many elementary particles together? What are its formation mechanisms? That is, what is its cosmic history? Did it form via a thermal mechanism? That is, from a thermal plasma? Did it come about via some non-thermal mechanism? All of these things we don't know about dark matter. Let's start with just knocking out a few things out of here. If dark matter had electric charge, that's no good. We've already seen that if dark matter interacted strongly with photons in the early universe, we would not see the structure we see in the cosmic microwave background, which you will learn more about from Blake next week, or the matter power spectrum, you, which you heard about yesterday from a scene. So that, the fact that dark matter cannot interact very strongly with photons tells you that the charge of dark matter, the electric charge, has to be less than about 10 to the minus 7 of the electron charge. Okay. That's what it tells you. It's weakly charged. What about dark matter's interaction with itself or with regular matter, say, protons or neutrons? The interaction of dark matter with itself can be constrained, for example, with the help of this beautiful observation of merging of two clusters called the bullet cluster. Okay, the bullet cluster is a thing that looks like a bullet. And this observation tells us that the self-interaction or the scattering cross-section of dark matter per mass has to be less than 10 to the minus 24 centimeters squared per GeV. This is about a nuclear cross-section. Okay, that's roughly what the number is. It's a very stringent limit when you think about its interaction with protons. Okay. This is from xenon. And as you can see, this number is going down to about 10 to the minus 40-ish. Yeah. 
for neutrons, it's even uh, it's slightly different. So that's charge knocked off. That's a little bit about uh, the self-interactions or interactions with the sun and model particles knocked off a bit. What about the mass? Here, we reveal that we really know nothing. Okay. The mass of dark matter particle is highly unconstrained. It can be as light as 10 to the minus 21 EV-ish. Okay. This is really light. I don't actually remember the exact number, but I'm not even sure if the constraint on the mass of the photon is that good. Okay. So this, we are, we are allowed to have massive cold dark matter that's this light. And nothing, it doesn't contradict observations. You are also allowed to have masses very high, uh, up to Planck scale, or if it's composite, even higher. So there's a huge range of dark matter mass that's available, and we don't know what the, what the mass of this constituent is. Very important for our purposes in this talk, we also don't know much about the spin of dark matter. We don't know whether it's a spin a half or a half integer spin, such as whether that's, whether that's a fermion or it's a boson. But we don't know some things. Regarding, to, regarding spin. If dark matter happens to be a fermion, its mass better be heavier than 100 EV, okay. which corresponds to saying that the de Broglie scale, assuming you know, usual typical velocities in our galaxy, has to be smaller than 10 to the minus 6 meters. Where does this come from? This comes from the simple fact that fermions don't like to sit on top of each other. They already knew about COVID way before we did. Right? So they, they were just socially distancing all the way from the beginning of the universe. Um, and that tells us, that maybe even tells us why they have to be heavier. Uh, but they, they cannot be lighter because you cannot pack so many of them in a given volume. We already know what the mass density of dark matter needs to be in a local neighborhood, about 0.3 GeV per centimeter cubed. Because of this restriction on how many fermions you can pack into a phase space volume, that in turn gives a restriction on what the mass can be. If it's too light, you cannot make up the mass density in a given region. So that restriction tells us that these fermions have, if dark matter is made up of fermions, it has to be heavier than 100 electron volts. On the other hand, if dark matter is bosonic, it has no such restrictions. You can pack as many bosons together as you want in a given volume. So you can make up the local mass density by just packing on very many, many very light bosons together. To give you an example of how many of these there can be in a typical volume, uh, de Broglie volume. Look at the numbers, right? If I make the mass of the dark matter particle about 10 to the minus 5 EV, this is like a QCD axion-like particle, okay? you have 10 to the 23 of them. Okay? This is humongous. Right? If I make it ultra light, like 10 to the minus 20 EV, this is going to be 10 to the 83. Right? So there are many, many particles. So how should I think about these? These are just Particles stacked one on top of the other, all sharing a roughly similar de Broglie wavelength, just stacked one on top of the other. It doesn't make much sense to talk about these objects individually. Okay? They're just sitting on top of each other. Indeed, the de Broglie scale corresponding to these masses that I've just said is macroscopic. So for an axion-like thing, the de Broglie scale, uh, for a QCD axion-like thing, the de Broglie scale is about tens of meters, perhaps. So that's macroscopic. For 10 to the minus 20 EV, it can be one parsec in size. So these are astrophysical scales for these particle sizes. Most and fine. they're all packed on top of each other. So it seems to make very little, so it perhaps motivates us that we shouldn't be thinking of them as individual particles. We should just be thinking of them as all sitting on top of each other a collection of them together, and we should be perhaps thinking of them as a field, right? as a classical field of this stuff. If you want, you can think of this as a condensate, uh, like a BEC. Yes? So about that fermionic argument, uh, I mean, 
They would have too much speed. We want them to be cold as well. Yeah, you would want them to be cold as well, right? Uh, can you repeat the question? Sorry, the question was, why can't we fill up higher levels? I believe the argument would be that they would not remain cold. They would move too fast. Okay. If you if you get to very high high states. Yes. yes. Uh, I guess. Re repeat the question. Oh, sorry, I keep on forgetting. What, the question was, what are promising candidates for, for fermionic dark matter? I think you could uh, pick something from Susie if that was something, uh, if your flavor is appealing to you. But any fermion that I can pick that has reasonably weak interactions with the standard model will work. Uh, yeah. There are some questions okay. uh, in the chat. Yes. I also have a question. I don't understand this second equation because the second and third term are, don't seem to be equal. What do you mean? Uh, <coughs> I meant, I mean, it's, I'm just uh, saying that the de Broglie scale for this mass particle for different masses is, uh, is different. Okay, now I got it. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. let me ask questions from yeah. this. Uh, can we say dark matter has both bosons and fermions since neutrinos are also alike? You could certainly have an admixture of fermions and bosons. Nothing is preventing that. In fact, you could have a whole dark sector that's present which could be similar to, somewhat similar to the standard model, right? Perhaps it's a prejudice of ours to think that dark matter is simple and made up of just one particle. It could be two particles. It could be an entire dark standard model sitting there. Right? So we don't know. More. Uh, can gravity overcome the degeneracy pressure due to Pauli's exclusion principle for fermions? Yes, but hopefully uh, not in our vicinity. Uh, that happens, of course, when you form black holes. Right? Like you're that is happening when you overcome gravity in neutron stars, that's exactly what is happening. You add more mass and you're overcoming the degeneracy pressure to go from a neutron star to a black hole. But not for dark matter, typically. It's not. Yes. For heavy fermions, why you don't see them? Yeah. Heavy fermions. Their, inter their interactions would be very weak, right? You have to produce them. So if the interaction is too weak with the standard model, how are you going to produce them? It's dark matter, its interactions are going to be very weak, or it, it has to be very weak, otherwise it would not be dark matter, right? Yeah, but if you are heavy, you are expected to be around at least the intensity effect. No, but suppose I have a particle that is completely non-interacting. How would you produce it at the LHC? It only interacts via gravity. Can you produce a, a particle? You, you can't, right? If, I, if it doesn't interact, to produce something, it has to interact with the stuff you're colliding, or it has via something, right? But uh, as detection methods try, try to say that maybe standard model particles interact and produce, produce without more than three you see some absence of some energy, and that doesn't happen. And for uh, heavy particles, it seems to be likely that there's something that happens. I'm not, okay, maybe I'll repeat the question and I'll try to answer it the way I understand it. Uh, so why don't we see heavy fermions, heavy dark matter fermions at the LHC? I think it would be great if we could see them, but if they don't, if the fermions don't interact much with the standard model, which is kind of expected for dark matter, they can't, it would be very hard to produce them there. Right? Um, it, does it, did it have to be that way? No. Perhaps we would have gotten lucky and we would have produced them at the LHC. We haven't, but that doesn't mean that dark matter cannot be a fermion. Right? It's just that its interactions would have been weak. I don't have a favorite. Uh, <laughs> so I, I'm a, so I, I wish uh, I don't have a good. Good candidate uh, in mind, yes. So there was a question about the degeneracy of the fermion like uh, dark matter, and I wanted to ask about uh, bosons, because uh, uh, there is no degener degeneracy in case of bosons, and don't they uh, just uh, collapse superficially? 
No. Why, why would they don't have to? Uh, I mean, photons don't. This is, of course, a slightly uh, contrived example, but photons are bosons. You're seeing me. OK. Uh, you can think of uh, many bosons that are non What would make them collapse, you think? But it, to collapse, right, it has to be somehow that there should be nothing preventing. We'll get to this a little bit in some of the examples. You have to have either have no, just gravity just pulling you inwards, and you have to have enough mass for it to collapse. Typically, there is something preventing that from happening. Okay? Usually, in the case of a field, maybe that's the, I'll interpret the question, whether you're asking that or not, uh, is if you have a field, usually there are gradients in the field. Gradients want to spread out, so they push outwards. Okay? And that prevents these things from just coming back in. Okay. There is, okay. of course, virialization. Sorry? Virialization. That's true. But I think if they were completely cold, uh, I thought the question was if they were completely cold, right? Uh, what would happen? OK. Uh, right, let's move on. This will be 10 hours, I think. Sorry, can <laughs> I ask another related? Can, can we assume that dark matter field um, is uh, excitation or dark matter? Let me read it. Can, can we assume a dark matter field or a potential and a state that dark matter particles are essentially excitations of this field instead of being fermions or both? Uh, I think if we, as we all should, if we believe quantum field theory, uh, every particle is an excitation of a field. Uh, so I think in that sense, yes, uh, these are excitations of a field. Okay. Let me now say, given all the good discussion we have had and given what I've said so far, I hope I've convinced you to some extent that when we think of light bosonic dark matter, it's not crazy to think about this as a field, a classical field, just with particles sitting on top of each other everywhere instead of thinking about them as individual particles. And once you start thinking about them as a classical field, uh, wave dynamics comes into play. You can think about linear and nonlinear wave dynamics. You can think about all the wonderful phenomena that fluid dynamicists and other people have figured out, such as interference effects, solitons, et cetera. Uh, these kinds of effects, of course, have been seen and have been explored for a long time in the context of condensed matter systems, such as Bose-Einstein condensates as well as in the early universe. Okay. So as I said, uh, now coming back to uh, a little bit away from the review part and getting back to my topic. So I want to talk about the spin of dark matter and whether we can distinguish them. Let me tell you that in the context of scalar dark matter, which is spin zero, okay, this has been explored quite a bit. We also heard a talk yesterday about this. Uh, we, People have been talking about QCD axions, fuzzy dark matter, many different names, and people have done simulations of these already on cosmological scales. And this is well explored by now. What we want to talk about is what are the differences if I think that dark matter is a vector field? Why? Does it have to be a vector? No. Does it have to be a scalar? No. We don't know. Why am I doing it? It's fun. Okay. I have no better, better reason. That's why I do physics. Okay. I wish I could tell you this is this, this observational exact motivation uh, for this, but there isn't. Okay. Uh, but there are implications of this which can be tested observationally. So you could potentially tell what is the nature. OK, so what is the fundamental underlying model that we are going to look at in case of vector dark matter? The underlying model is the following. It's very simple. It's just electromagnetism with a mass added to it. That's it. So it's the electromagnetic field trans strength tensor. That's g mu nu, capital G mu nu. W is the vector field. I've added a mass term to it. That's what the second term in the action is. And then there is gravity. This is very similar to a scalar field action that some of you might be familiar with. It's the Klein-Gordon action. If you're worried about loss of gauge invariance, et cetera, you could imagine that there is a, this is an abelian Higgs model. I've integrated out the Higgs, uh, if you want. Okay. 
But this is the model. It's just a massive vector field. And for the moment, I'm, going to ignore, I'm only going to consider gravitational interactions, no others. But I want to do dark matter. One of the things we know about dark matter, that in the today's universe, it's pretty non-relativistic. It doesn't move very fast. Okay. Which means the spatial and temporal scales are slow. Okay. There's nothing relativistic about dark matter. As a result, it would be stupid to take the entire action and try to simulate this and try to get structure formation. Because I'll get information that I don't need. Okay. It's, I will get, so for example, this has a mass. The mass, it's a field, it's a real field. It's just going to oscillate with that frequency of the mass. And that frequency is going to be on the mass scale, which is much higher than the Hubble scale. There is no way I can track that many oscillations numerically or otherwise for an entire Hubble time. So I shouldn't be tracking that. A better thing to do would be to write down the action for the slow degrees of freedom. What I do in detail is you take the real valued vector field, you split it into a slow part, that's the field psi, and a fast part, which is e to the imt. I've written down c's and h bars here. I will not refer to them uh, because we don't refer to such things. Okay. Uh, but I have written them for just because Talking to different audiences, it's sometimes it's useful to, to have them in there. OK. So the fast part. Can I is ask a question? Yes. Um, so when we couple a massive vector to uh, other fields, uh, unless we couple it contracting it with a current, we usually introduce a, a cutoff to the theory. Um, I just want to, I was wondering when we couple it to gravity, which is going to be important, uh, do, do we also, so in the, in the theory that you wrote down, is there, is, you know, can I think of the cutoff as M Planck or do I, the fact that I have a massive vector, do I, does that mean I have a lower cutoff? I don't know if for this field there is a lower cutoff. This is just a, an interact, a massive vector field. I guess one way of thinking about a cutoff here is also that I've integrated out the Higgs here, so mm -hmm. that will introduce a scale. Uh, if that's the ultraviolet theory that we began with, but otherwise I don't think there is. But maybe I could be. I haven't thought enough about this. Uh, yeah, I just mean so if I if I couple this W, if, if I wrote down say W squared times phi squared, where phi is a real scalar, it uh, it. It means there's a cutoff, and the th secretly there's a cutoff in the theory. That's true. That's true. But, but uh, I don't know. I've never seen it when you couple it to gravity in the minimal way. I, I I just don't know. I was wondering if you knew if there's a cutoff. But yes. I can tell you a little bit about it, but maybe if you don't mind, it will take us too Absolutely. far away. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, Sorry. From, from the talk. Go ahead. So let's talk a little bit later uh, about yeah. this. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Let's, uh, okay, so I integrate out the fast modes and I write down an action for the slow modes. Is this new? No. This has been done for scalars for a while now. Okay. In the case of scalars, the psi is just a complex number okay, at each point in space and time. In the case of a vector, this is just supposed to be three complex numbers. The field is actually real. I'm just decomposing it into this part, and then I'll take the real part eventually if I need to. Surprisingly, this for vectors hadn't been done, uh, I don't know why, until recently, and, uh, but it's, it's straightforward enough to do. You can also do this for higher spin fields. Phi, by the way, here is the Newtonian potential. What are the equations of motion? The equations of motion for this field are the Schrodinger and the Poisson equation. We've already been introduced to the Poisson equation before. That's the Laplacian of phi equals you're familiar with it by saying it's 4 pi g rho. Right? The rho here is m, time, m times psi dagger psi. Okay? So psi squared, micro psi squared, is your number density. The Schrodinger equation, I'm sure all of you are familiar with, but we have to be careful. Okay? It is a Schrodinger equation, but psi does not represent any probability density. Okay? There is no probabilistic interpretation here. This is not quantum mechanics. It's the same equation, but there is no probability interpretation. Psi squared is just a number density. 
There's no normalization of the wave function here. So it's not a wave function in that sense. People sometimes call this a wave function, but I think it's a, it's just bad nom nomenclature to say that. So compared to the scalar case, this is a Schrodinger equation which is multi-component. It has three components here, but otherwise it's the same. You can repeat the same exercise for a spin S field, which has two S plus one components, and the result is the same. So this is a very general construction. You can start with the action, take the non-relativistic limit, you will end up with a Schrodinger Poisson system if you only have gravity. You could worry about whether in the ultraviolet the spin S, a higher spin field is well defined or not, but that's not our concern today. Okay, at this level, this is nothing more than just a collection of two S plus one scalars. So for a vector, it's just three scalars with the same mass. Okay. For those who are interested, here is a fluid version of those equations as well. You can trans translate a schrodinger poisson system into an equation that's perhaps familiar uh, from the lectures on, uh, on structure formation. You can translate into continuity and Euler equations and, th uh, and things like that. As always, once you want to understand something about a theory, you should write down the conserved quantities in the theory because I am as I'll show you, I do numerical simulations as well, and this is very useful right, to know these kinds of things are conserved. They're respected by your simulations, just like they're respected by the theory itself. So because it's a non-relativistic theory, the particle number is conserved. That's defined the first line. The energy is conserved, obviously, time translation invariance. The total angular momentum is, of course, conserved, rotational invariance. But importantly, in this non-relativistic limit, the spin angular momentum and the orbital angular momentum are separately conserved. They're not, it's not just a sum which has to be conserved, but they're in individually conserved as well. And this will be important for us. Okay, so now let me tell you a little bit about some fun um, effects about this. My plan here is to do it for pedagogical purposes. I'll first present you with the analytic results. Then I will show you that those analytic results are okay by showing you detailed results of simulations as well. Okay. And I will also, for pedagogical reasons, keep on comparing the answers to what you would expect from the scalar case. So that's the plan. The first result I want to present is embarrassingly simple, which is great. Okay. It's, and this is a result that we should know from freshmen, or from a first course in uh, waves which is waves have interference. You take two waves and add them together. Take two scalar waves in a scalar field, add them together, you will have interference. What do I mean by that? The square of the sum will not be equal to the sum of the squares. There'll be a, there'll be a cross term. For a scalar field, this has to happen. You can't avoid this. Now think of a vector field. A vector field has three components. Each component necessarily interferes with it with the same component from another wave. But if I put two waves in two orthogonal components, there'll be no interference. So from this simple argument, you realize that given if you fix a total amount of dense, of mass density or particle density in a given region or the average, some average quantity in a given region, then the amount of interference will be lowered in vectors compared to scalars. Does that make sense, right? Yeah. And this should get this can be generalized to a spin S field. The more components you have in the field, the less interference there can be because you can distribute the same amount of stuff into many different components, which are orthogonal to each other. I'm showing you a cartoon version below where I have superposed a large number of plane waves. The orange is vector dark matter. The blue is scalar dark matter. The average density is the same in both. You notice that the peaks are higher and the valleys are deeper in scalar, that is blue, compared to vectors, because that's what you should expect. You just don't, interference is what causes, what causes the large excursions. You can do this a little bit more formally, but there's nothing more to it. The amount of interference, because you have three components, will be down by a square root of three for vectors compared to scalars. You can generalize this as a very difficult homework problem to the fact that this will be square root of 2s plus 1 if you have a spin s field. 
Okay. So that's the result there. Next, I'm going to tell you about another implication, which I really love soliton, so I can talk ad nauseum about these, but stop me if I go off on tangents. Okay. Uh, solitons are these fascinating things that exist in nonlinear field theories. Okay. They were first discovered by the gentleman on the horse there with a the top hat. Okay. He was riding along a canal uh, somewhere near Edinburgh, and he saw that a boat came to a stop and created a pulse in the channel. And that pulse, he claimed, he followed it on horseback, did not dissipate. It just maintained its shape and kept on going. And he followed it for two, two and a half miles or something. He didn't use those units. Uh, and then it disappeared into the woods. Right? And that was a discovery of a soliton in water waves. Okay? This is a type of soliton. The theory was developed later. So on the top, you're seeing the recreation of that same event done more recently in the same canal. Uh, let me see up there. By the way, solitons, this is not just a curiosity. They're definitely seen in fluid dynamics. Uh, they have been seen in optics, hydrodynamics, both ions and condensates. The green things are places where they've seen them. We would love to see them in high energy physics and cosmology. Uh, there are many ideas, many theories propose that they should be there. We haven't seen, we, have, we don't have a detection of them in any, any form yet. It would be great to have them. Okay, we're going to be talking about a particular class of solitons, which are called non-topological, which means they are not, so the solitons generally, why do they exist, right? They exist because some, some two opposing things are preventing them from dispersing or decaying away. They hold, something holds them together. Sometimes it's topology. Other times, it's nothing to do with topology. It's to do with the configuration itself. When it's got to do with the configuration or there's some conserved charge in them, uh, even approximate, then they're called non-topological solitons. And for our purposes, there are two types, um, those that are held together by gravity and those that are held together by self-interactions. There's a long history of this. I won't bore you with the details. But these things, if you look at the real field inside them for each component, it's just oscillating up and down. This is very weird. You would think that they would just disperse away. Okay? But some sort of attractive interaction is holding them in place and preventing the gradient pressure that would try to push them apart. Okay? So that's what's holding them together. And they will keep on doing this for a very long time, in some cases, for cosmologically long time. The scalar solitons here have been known in the literature for a while. Uh, these are sometimes called boson stars. They're basically a collection of bosonic particles, a coherent collection of bosonic particles. The real valued field is oscillating inside. The density profile is just looks roughly like a Gaussian. You can describe the solution, the non-relativistic part of the solution, with the help of this profile times e to the i mu t. Mu, you should think of as a binding energy per particle, whereas m is the mass of the boson itself. I think something that's important is that the mass of, total mass of this object is m Planck squared over m. That's the coefficient that appears. m Planck is a huge number. m, which is the mass of the boson, is a very small number. That means this mass is a huge number compared to just the mass of the particle. Okay. So it's a macroscopic object. It's not at the level of a quantum. It's a macroscopic object. The same is true for the, for the radius. It's a macroscopically sized object. The thing that's determining why it's macroscopic in terms of the radius is this ratio m over mu. M is the rest mass, mu is the binding energy. For a non-relativistic particle, the binding energy will be very small compared to the rest mass, so the radius will be very big. The same, even though that ratio is going to be small, it doesn't affect this m Planck squared over m very much. Okay, good. So what types of solitons do you have now that I've told you about a scalar case? So you said mu is a free parameter? Sorry? Mu is a free parameter. Mu is a free parameter. So you have a one parameter family of solutions. Okay. So for any mu, you have a solution. 
So there are many masses and there are many radii, meaning for a given mass, there's a given radii, but there's a whole family of solutions. Thanks, Berta. Yes? Uh, nice question. So this uh, functional form of psi solid summon of x is known, or is it only numerically? Is it analytically known, or is it numerically known? I mean, it's, and it's numerically known, but it's at the level of one ordinary differential equation, in the sense that it's just, if you have a shooting solution, right? right. It's, and if you wanted, there are very good analytic approximations to that, but there's no, it cannot be written down in terms of a, of simple functions, okay? Like known trig functions or something like that. You can't write it down. Quest, question was about the form of psi solution of right, the yeah. X. Yeah, sorry, I, I will repeat from now on. Otherwise, Merida, you can throw chalks at me. Yeah. Okay. So what do you do for vectors? It's, now it's simple. You already know about the scalar case. You have to do it for a vector. You just take the scalar solution and multiply it by a polarization vector. Done. That's your vector soliton. You know from electromagnetism, you can think of polarization in terms of circular polarization and linear polarization. Those are your bases. Right? So let's think of the epsilon that I've written multiplying the profile or multiplying the full solution as one of those. So linearly polarized one is the first one that's written up here. And I'm showing you what the real valued field would do inside. It would just oscillate up and down. Okay, the vector would just oscillate up and down everywhere. So it's pointing this way and just going up and down. For a circularly polarized one, at each point, the vector field will be moving in a circle. So these are two possible polarized solitons, which are only possible because of the vector nature of the field. For a scalar, there is no such quantity. There is no polarization to talk about. Yes, please. Is the polarization not a dynamical variable? No. Why is that? I mean, di dynamical in what sense? Oh, sorry? Ah, <laughs> chalk, man, chalk. <laughs> uh, so the question was, is polarization a dynamical variable? Maybe I should answer more carefully. Here, epsilon being a constant is, provides a solution. Mm -hmm. okay? uh, and all solitons that we know of come with epsilon being a constant. Okay? All solitons in this, they, they don't depend on time. Uh, there could be higher energy states or some other configurations where this epsilon would also vary with time. So general solutions could, of course, vary. But for solitonic configurations that I'm talking about, it's a constant in space okay? and time. Yeah. Okay. Can I ask a question? Yes, from the uh, nebulous internet, please. Yes, uh, sorry. <laughs> I'll turn on my camera. I don't know if you can see me. Um, so these, uh, these um, on the one hand, these objects are stationary. Yes. On the other hand, I guess we want to identify its constituent particles with some kind of virialized velocity. My question is, do I still, can I still interpret different polarization vectors as transverse versus longitudinal? Uh, I would not do it at the level of individual particles, okay? I would mm -hmm. do it at the level of the field itself, okay? It's not, I think we've already taken the non-relativistic limit where I can't, I've integrated, in some sense, I've dropped all scales relevant for the individual particles, right, at the, Com at the Compton scale. The other reason I wouldn't think of this as transverse and, uh, transverse and this is transverse with respect to what? Right. This is not a massless particle. There's no sort of fundamental direction I can talk about. So here when I say this is longitudinal polarization and transverse polarization in that sense, but with respect to what? With respect to some axis that I pick. Okay, it's an arbitrary axis that I picked. It's not something inherent to the particle that I can pick. Hopefully that answers the question. Uh, sorry, but so if a particle has a small velocity, like at the level of the particle, if it has a small velocity, I think it still makes sense to think about transverse versus longitudinal. But this is a, this is a massive particle, right? What is the unique? Yes. How are you going to split it uniquely? You can talk about it if you want. Uh, well, the, so the, uh, the, the longitudinal, longitudinal polarization would be the one which is uh, in parallel to the, K four, the three momentum. Sure. I think if and the you want, would be. Sure. I think if you want to do it at the level of the particles, that's perfectly. I, I'm not saying it's not impossible, but 
I, I don't see a big benefit uh, to doing that, at least in, in what I'm going to say. I'm not saying it's not possible. It's also, I don't think about it this way. It's just because you are, when so many particles are sitting on top of each other, forming this mm -hmm. field, I find it, it almost becomes confusing to think of each one of them having an independent identity. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, the other question okay. you asked, which I did not answer, uh, which was about realization and so on, uh, the velocity dispersion for this is roughly the inverse of the length scale of the object. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Thank okay. You. Uh, there is also a question in the Zoom asking how uh, the scalar and vector dark matter are getting related to the scalar and vector solitons. So, scalar dark matter is can be organize itself into scalar solitons. Vector dark matter can organize itself into vector solitons. So they are not, it's not that solitons are all of dark matter. It's just these are configurations possible within specific classes of dark matter. OK, let me move on. Uh, one of the important things that comes out of these solitons vector solitons is that they can have spin angular momentum. You can calculate the spin by taking a cross product of the polarization vectors. And for the linearly polarized one, it has zero spin. For a circularly polarized one, it has a spin equal to h bar times a particle number. Okay. Again, particle number you can just get by integrating out the, by integrating the mass over, the mass of the soliton, getting the total mass of the soliton if you want. OK, so this can be, because the mass of the soliton is big and the mass of the boson is small, this ratio can be macroscopically large right? or really big. This is just a number of particles. So that's why these things, I got really fascinated by this, that this is an object with a gigantic macroscopic spin. But not big enough to make it elliptical. Not big enough to make it elliptical because in the non-relativistic limit, gravity knows nothing about spin. It's just a collection of three scalars. So it doesn't know that there is a spin, there's an angular momentum that gravity cares about. So it doesn't, in a full GR case, it will care. In the non-relative cyclic limit, no, it doesn't. Yes, does somebody, okay. By the way, these are two examples of these solitons. You could take, because both of these end up having the same total energy for a fixed particle number, that means I can take linear superpositions of these guys and create a fractionally polarized object. So I can take, I can put this basis solitons together in appropriate, appropriate coefficients and create a fractionally polarized object, which will have a spin between zero and this maximal value. And all of these configurations have the same total energy. Yes. If you are only using Newtonian gravity, none. Okay. If Newtonian gravity is your only probe far away, you cannot tell the difference. It's the same. It's exactly the same as it is for scalars, and it's the same for each polarization. So the question was that from the point of view of a distant observer is do different spins uh, have some implications? Thank you. <laughs> See, if I was taking an exam, I would fail uh, many times over. OK, uh, yes. Yeah, you can take, take, think of it that way. Yeah. Projection. Projection along the z. I mean, here I've taken them to be along the z axis. So. OK, one thing I want to make sure I, I mention, right, is that this, so these solitons are new, the ones I've talked about. Essentially, we found them in the last year. You would think this is such a simple thing. Why hasn't been, this been discussed in the literature, these polarized solitons with macroscopic spin? 
I suspect, and I don't know for sure, of course, is that we were misled, perhaps, by symmetry. So the simplest configuration you could think of, perhaps, with a vector field, which would be spherically symmetric, not just in the mass density, but also in the field configuration. You would think that the field should also point radially outwards or inwards. That is the simplest symmetric situation you could think of. But if you think about it a little bit, if it's a vector field and it's either pointing in or out, then it has to go to zero at the origin. How will it choose which direction to go in, right? It, has to be, it cannot be multi-valued. That means that the profile of the soliton, if it was a vector that was pointing radially outwards, has to have a node at the origin. You perhaps know from quantum mechanics that solutions with nodes usually cost more energy than solutions without nodes. So this gives you some intuition for why, even though this is a perfectly good solution, it might be a higher energy state than the ones I've been discussing whose profile doesn't go to zero at the origin. It's a nice Gaussian profile. So these, the, the hedgehog ones, the ones that are all pointing outwards, porcupine one, they've been known in the literature. They're often called procastars. Okay. Uh, those are fine. It's just they seem to be higher energy than the ones we are discussing here. And in simulations, the ones we have done, we have only seen these objects forming, the, the lower energy states, not the hedgehogs, very easily at least. Doesn't mean they don't exist. It's just it's harder. I should also mention a caveat that everything I'm talking about is a non-relativistic limit. If I do a full GR case where I'm getting close to compactness of neutron stars and so on, I don't know which one is the lowest energy state anymore. We haven't done that yet. So there are some questions in the chat. Do you yes. take them now? Uh, so one is that why do you assume, or do you assume that the spins are aligned in this soliton? Or is there a reason for them to be aligned? And okay, the other one is that why doesn't this boson star collapse because of gravitation and form a black hole? Uh, the reason, let me answer both of them, but they're very relevant questions. The reason it doesn't collapse is because there is a gradient pressure, right? The field wants to disperse off because of gradients. You can think of this as gradient energy. Or, uh, gradient pressure, sometimes people call it quantum pressure, I don't like the word, but it's just gradients wanting to, to move outwards. And gravity is trying to pull you in. Uh, they, uh, there's a balance between them if you want. It's a static solution because of the balance between the two. This is the usual case of why stars exist, right? Like something is pushing out, something is pulling in, gravity is usually pulling in. The same reason stars exist, these boson stars also exist. It's a, it's a pressure associated with gradients. Uh, the other question was, about what do I, do I assume the spins are aligned? No, I don't assume, I mean, they're aligned in the sense that for a soliton to exist, for a soliton solution, this polarization, what I mean, actually, ah, okay. This polarization vector that you see on the top, for a minimum energy solution, the polarization vector is a constant in space, which means the cross product of it will also be a constant in space at every point in space. So in that sense, the spin density at each point is pointing in the same direction. It doesn't matter where, where, whether it's linearly polarized, circularly polarized, or a combination of them. This will always be true. OK. And you will see that it, there's nothing deep about there being a constant spin density. It's just you take a collection of three fields, put them together in a configuration with having the same profile, unless they're perfectly in phase, you will end up generating a spin density in them. OK. Let me just tell you what we have said so far. I've told you that there are solitons in scalars. I've just introduced you to the idea that there could be solitons with higher spin, so it's extending a new axis in this plot. How much time have I taken, Merdad? I have already taken it? Yes. Wow. OK. Um, I will speed up a little bit. Uh, so, and we'll take a break maybe after 10 minutes from here so that we, we recover a bit. And then we'll start over for the next 15 minutes, if that's OK. OK. So let me give you some phenomenology for these. Sorry. the. 
the numerical phenomenology that will be connected to what I've just said. This is, I think, perhaps the most fun part. Okay. So notice that I've got two panels on here. The first part is, the first row is a simulation of vector dark matter. The bottom row is a simulation of scalar dark matter. The colors are the mass density, projected mass density. I start both simulations with the same initial conditions in terms of their density. There are some idealized halos. In this case, they're solitons themselves. And I let this go. This is a full three plus one dimensional simulation. You, and some of the first ones that have been done on this, so you start this, you move this forward, and you notice at the end of it, the time is running towards me. At the end of the simulation, you see some very similar structure. There's some dense region in the center with some fuzzy stuff around. I don't know if the screen is allowing it, but hopefully you can see some differences between the two, slight differences. Okay. Anybody want to, want to take a guess what the differences are? Uh, let's not look at the boundaries too much. Let's look, uh, doesn't have to be in the center. Yes, go ahead. Exactly, interference patterns, okay? Where do we see more interference? In the scalar one. Look, there are more dark and bright spots here compared to the one top. This is what we should expect. This is exactly what we see. Okay. There's also detailed information about the soliton, but you can't see it on the screen. Okay. So let me tell you about the detailed difference in the central regions. Okay. Okay. So the scalars here, I'm looking at the final result of this merger process, which is a collection of uh, initial conditions. By the way, I should tell you that you might have a question about what, are the, what do I choose for the polarization of the vectors and all of these things, because vectors have so much freedom. We do lots of things, meaning we choose random polarization vectors, we choose unpolarized cases, we do basically do of order 100 simulations with all different initial conditions. Okay. And we will compare, when I present you the results, it's either an average of them or uh, the spread is what I see for all of the simulations together. Okay. And then I plot the average, yes. So these are two simulations at, for the same mass of the particle itself. Yes. But if I change the mass, I, can, I would imagine that the interference pattern would be affected because the de Broglie wavelength would change. Does that make sense? The, we, if, I assume if, you, if you give me a few moments, yeah. we'll exactly get to this point. <laughs> Okay. Because but, I'm just worried that uh, when you say that this is vector and this is scalar and the scalar has more interference, uh, could it just be that I could see a different vector, a different scalar with a different mass with less interference and mistaken, mistake it for a vector? See what I, mean? I will try to argue that there is a degeneracy that can be broken. Okay, but we can certainly it's a it's a it's a very valid question. Okay, but we are just getting in a in a in a couple of slides we'll get to this. Okay. Uh, I did not repeat the question. Uh, the uh, Question was whether there's a degeneracy between scalar and vector interference patterns depending upon if I am allowed to choose different masses for the particle. Yes. Um, okay. So here I'm showing this for the same mass of the particle, same total initial mass, everything is the same, okay, as much as I can make it. And you notice that in this simulation, uh, the profile, the density profile, this is angularly averaged, is different for the two cases. The vector case is in red, the scalar case is in blue. The vector case is, as you can see, is shallower in the center compared to the scalar case. Okay? The scalar is allowed to get more dense in the center. Another important thing, hopefully, uh, you notice is that far away from the core, they start looking similar. It doesn't really matter whether it's a vector or scalar. You might be worried that I won't know what the initial mass of the system. Here, I, it's very idealized simulations where I know the initial conditions perfectly. What if I didn't know the central core? Well, if you, if you normalize by the central core density, done over many different masses, you notice that there is a difference in shape as well. Okay? The difference in shape is that the transition from the inner region to the outer region for vectors is smoother than that for scalars. 
I cannot give you a full analytic argument for this, but it's very, it will be very, it's basically because of interference again. Okay, there are three components that don't allow you to have a very distinct region between the two. Just some uh, confirmation about interference. Uh, here is a density PDF of, uh, or a histogram of densities in my box. You notice that the scalar case, which is in blue, can go all the way to zero densities, but the vector case doesn't, right? Because it just it can't have that much interference. Similarly, the excursion at the high density regions is more for scalars compared to vectors. This is again coming from uh, coming from interference, or it's basically dominated by a central soliton. By the way, I should have mentioned that. Um, the central, if you actually, you can fit the shape of these profiles very well in the center with the help by taking a soliton profile. So that's why I'm saying that there's a soliton in the middle. So there's a central soliton profile that's fit very well, and then the outer core. This is Ex now getting. Sorry. But, sorry to, to yeah. butt in from the sky. Yeah. Um, why do you have solitons as initial conditions? Very good question, because it was easy to do. Okay. Uh, okay. I will talk about, uh, because I know the solution, I, it's easy to start with. Uh, we will, I will talk about formation mechanisms, and I'll tell you what other people have done where they don't sort with solitons as well. Uh, this is a, the whole idea here for us was to do a control simulation, where we could tell the difference very exactly when we start with identical conditions, and this was the easiest thing we could do. But we don't have to. But Okay, but I, so the, ideally, would you want to start with some Gaussian distribution? Yeah, I, I'll yeah. get to it. If, okay, well, okay, sorry. I'm not I'll sure if I will, want... but okay. uh, <laughs> I, I might not get to it, but I will at least, you can look at the slides, and I, I talk a lot about formation in the second Thanks. half of the talk, which will not happen. Uh, okay, here is a picture of the correlation length of these... Uh, interference patterns, okay? So I just did a two-point correlation function in density, and what you find is basically the, if you normalize by the central density, uh, you find that it's, the two-point correlation function sits exactly on top of each other, which means that they have the same de Broglie length, whether it's scalars or vectors, okay? So this, I assume, is going towards answering a bit of your question. They have the same de Broglie scale here. Okay? Why? Because the, this de Broglie scale is just a gravitational thing. It's 1 over mv. For the same mass, they will have the same de Broglie scale. It doesn't matter whether it's a vector or a scalar. Okay, it's exactly the same thing. It's just a smooth potential that determines the scale. However, because of interference, the amplitude of the interference pattern, or the amplitude of the fluctuations, is going to be lower for vectors compared to scalars. So same de Broglie scale, but different amplitude for scalars versus vectors. That's how you can tell the difference. So one example that I really like, uh, which is very recent, uh, and we'll... Sorry. Yes? Uh, what happens to the amplitude if I change the mass? I think the delta rho over rho has to be the same, regardless of... Uh, so delta rho over rho typically is of order unity. Okay. This is just an interference pattern on top of a smooth, smooth thing. It's just the difference between vectors and scalars will be 1 over square root of 3. That's to say, it's not a statement about the nature of the field or anything, right? It's just... We can, we can. Okay, okay. Okay, I will skip this in view of time. And uh, if you don't mind, let's take a... Uh, I'll take a five-minute break because we've been going on for quite some time, and I cannot imagine anybody's attention, given that I'm giving the talk and I'm bored. I'm sure you are as well. Uh, so let's take a five-minute break, and then we can continue, if that's okay. Yeah.